Welcome to the Scottish branch of the Arboricultural Association's Not Time webinar. Uh, my name is Matthew Cooper. Um, we've got two people in the background helping out as well, um, Sarah and Chris. So if you do have any questions, um, then please put them in the chat. Uh, Chris will be monitoring the chat. Um, can you just make sure that you do um, select attendee, all attendees and panellists, because it will default to just panellists. Um, and then everyone can see see your chat um, and they know what you're saying. Um, so we've got quite a few knots to, to get through um, today. So basically, we might as well get started. Um, just a bit of housekeeping first. Um, do bear in mind that we, we are talking about knot tying that's going to suspend you in a tree in many cases. So don't, don't use any of these knots unless you're absolutely sure on how to use it. This, although it is a webinar, it's not training. Um, so ideally, make sure you you sort of um, use these knots with an experienced person around you or a trainer that knows how to use the, the knots properly. Um, to that end, I should probably give you a little bit about my background. Uh, basically, I'm Matthew Cooper. Um, I'm an arboricultural trainer and consultant um, here in Scotland. Um, so I'm not a knot tying expert per se. Um, I'm just a person who's climbed trees all their professional life um, and for a large part of it um, have used solely knots, although probably as with everyone, uh, mechanical devices have become more and more of a, a thing in the last sort of decade or so. Um, so again, also bear in mind whenever you're tying knots, you need to consider what the ropes are you using so basically generally speaking we'll use for the friction hitches especially we're using a thicker knot and then a thick thicker rope sorry and then a thinner rope compared to it um, but even with your termination knots you've got to bear in mind how much you bend a piece of rope um, and what impact that'll have on the strength of the rope whenever you compress a rope uh, basically the in inside edge of that element um, the fibers are compressed so effectively you lose a portion of the strength now there's been various research done on this, but generally speaking, when you get a one-to-one -one ratio, it can be a lot more than this, but you're looking at a loss of about 30%. Um, I've seen figures as high as 56%, um, but basically do bear that in mind and bear in mind the construction of the ropes, the fibers they use in the rope might change that dramatically as well. Um, and then one to two ratios. So some of the knots we'll be looking at, basically you wrap it around two bits of rope for your termination knots. That again, that's a, a sort of slightly better situation. Um, you get a lower loss in that compressive element of the knot. Um, but bear in mind, if you're clipping it into a carabiner or something, um, then that could be less. So if you've got a thicker rope onto a thinner carabiner, then your, your, your loss of strength can be even more significant. So to do that, bear that in mind. Bear in mind compatibility, how things fit together, um, and bear in mind what you're doing to the knot. We'll chat about that as we go through though. Also, when you're tying a knot, make sure you dress it properly. All these knots, if they're left loose, um, they can sort of come apart. So just bear that in mind. So make sure you dress and tighten them. I will be showing you how to do that. Uh, we're going to be doing it by a series of videos. Um, so hopefully they're a little bit clearer than me trying to do it all through a webcam. Um, but basically, um, make sure you dress it um, and then proof load it to make sure it's actually holding it properly um, before you actually go on to, to use it. So especially with the friction hitches. So on to some knots then. So the first one we're going to look at is the cow hitch. The audio isn't particularly loud. Um, so basically I'll just sort of chat over it as we're going. So I'll just play the first video. Um, this is obviously the knot. It's probably the simplest knot. I've tried to do these in an order. Um, although I had lots of requests and they came in in different orders. Um, I've tried to develop them from the simplest knot to the most complicated knot. Um, so this is the first one. Um, the cow hitch is also sometimes called a lark's foot knot. Um, this is just a very simple choker so to tie. Tail, 
So that's the cow hitch. I'll maybe just play it again and just pause it on the way through. So basically... A cow hitch is also sometimes called a lamp. I'll just minimise that sound. So you can see here, basically, how it's just looped over itself. Similar in a lot of respects to the first part of a prussic knot, uh, which we'll be looking at a little bit later on. But it's a great tie-on for a onto timber. So it'll grip reasonably well and it's very straightforward to do. There are a lot of other uh, good ways. I quite often use this for tying on blocks. Um, it's quite useful when you're rigging, quite a useful technique. Um, and you can see there, because we've got one to two ratio on the knot, basically you have got that slightly bigger bend radius. Um, so that makes it a little bit better from the point of view of loading onto the knot. Um, it is quite important to use these tie-offs because it's quite a loose knot, so it can come open quite easily. And, and come apart as you can see when I'm tying it. So basically that's that's why we've got those half hitch elements on, uh, just to prevent that, that pulling through. Um, next one, this is very much a termination knot, so I'll just play this one, the bunt line hitch. Bunt line hitch, so it's a similar to a half double fisherman's, a cinched attachment knot. So what we're gonna do These are quite useful because they'll actually hold on to whatever you put them onto. As I said, it's a cinching knot, so it'll it'll tighten it, tighten it down quite nicely. Um, here in the UK, quite often the the number of lengths I said five times there because I was noticing that we were getting a lot of people from sort of North America, which is more common the five times in North America. I understand, um, but we quite often have a tail that as short as two and a half times the diameter of the rope uh, with these cinching knots. Uh, but yeah, that just to show you a little bit of the variation there. So I'll just run through that again. Uh, so just lower that sound down. So it's a relatively straightforward knot to do. Um, I, I'm trying to liken a lot of these knots to knots that I, I'm assuming that you will all know. Uh, that's maybe not a great assumption, um, but quite a lot of them, once you learn a few, you'll see that they're very similar to each other. So for example, that figure eight shape is incredibly common. Um, and you're just basically altering the, the position that you, you put that in and then that'll lock it down. So you can see this time, you just need to make sure you go onto that static end of the rope so that, that it actually holds on. If you, if you put it onto the other end, it, it won't work at all. Um, so that basically locks onto that. And that's, it's probably not the best of the cinching knots. If you do like that kind of gripping knot that grips onto a carabiner, um, then the half double fisherman's, I think someone asked for a, um, a fisherman's knot, um, and I've assumed that you meant half double fisherman's. Um, Chris is keeping an eye on the chat, so basically, if that wasn't the case, let me know, um, and I can just quickly do a fisherman's knot just on the webcam. Um, but a single fisherman's isn't particularly used in a borough culture, um, so um, let's just move on to the next one. So, this is a figure eight knot. A lot of people asked for figure eight or similar, and I wasn't sure whether they were asking for the stopper knot or the termination knot, so I've done both just to be on the safe side, so here we go. The figure eight knot can be used either as a stopper knot or as an attachment knot. So we'll start with the stopper knot. So make a bite, loop your working end over your static end, all the way around the back, and then once you see the eight, tuck that in through there. That's your figure eight knot, so you can see that in H shape. If you want to make it as a touch knot, it's exactly 
Now, as an attachment knot, that, there's loads of different ways of tying this, and you will see various methods if you if you look online where they actually tie the figure eight originally and then follow it round, and it does make a neater version. Um, this is slightly easier to tie, but it does end up looking slightly less tidy, um, as you can see. Um, it's quite a bulky termination knot, though, so it's not not maybe the 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 most sort of popular in arboriculture, generally speaking, uh, but it's quite keen if you're from a sort of mountaineering background, so I'll just play those again. A figure eight knot can be used either as a stopper knot or as an attachment knot. So we'll start with the stopper knot. So make a bite, loop your working end over your static end, all the way around the back. And once you see the eight, tuck that in through there. That's your figure eight knot, so you can see that eight shape. If you want to make it as a attachment knot, it's exactly the same. So now termination knot wise, it's probably not the most popular. We'll get to bow lines a little bit later on because we're hopefully building up complexity so you can sort of see each knot is just a little bit extra to the one before. Um, but as far as the cinching termination knots are concerned, this is probably my favorite. It's often called a fisherman's knot. So um, there is a single fisherman's knot as well. And a lot of people that asked for this did ask for the fisherman's knot. Um, but I'm guessing this is what they meant. The reason it's called a half double fisherman's is because it's usually a double fisherman's, which we'll see later is for tying two ends of ropes together. So we're going to look at, I think what one person asked for was a fisherman's loop, um, which is we're going to see later. But the half double fisherman's is just using that as a termination knot. So basically tying the rope into a, into a bite in itself. So we'll just play this one. Sorry. Just suspect what was asked for was actually the half double fishman's. Um, so this can either be used as a stop knot or as an attachment knot. So I'll start again with the, the stop knot. So basically loop it over itself, wrap it around your static end twice and then tuck it in through that way. See if you got it right because you'll have a cross on one side parallel lines on the other. This is quite a useful stop knot. It's my favourite stop knot because it sits very neatly. And you also probably remember seeing it if you climb a tree motion harness because this will be the knot basically on the end of the bridge. Now if you want to use it as a termination knot, it's exactly the same. You have to tie it slightly differently. So we make a bite initially and then start working it end wrap it around as if we were doing a figure eight but then we just keep going and then basically tuck that up through the loops we've created but again you can still see the parallel lines and the cross that we had previously the important thing to remember about this is load onto any carabiner that you use as an attachment and hold very tightly. It still needs to be dressed, so you still need to dress it. And this tail must be at least two and a half times the diameter of the rope you're using. But it'll hold on to whatever you tie it on to. But as soon as you take the carabiner or whatever else it is out, then you won't hold it. So very, very handy knot. It is a little bit more complicated to tie, so I'll just play that again and just sort of chat through it as we go in. So the termination knot is is quite handy. I'd forgotten I'd actually put that in there. Um, but the termination knot 
is quite a useful element as well. Um, I mentioned a particular brand of harness there. Um, it's just one that I'm familiar with, but it, do, it is used on a lot of terminations on, on bridges where they use a rope bridge. Um, so you have got this sort of quite handy sort of termination knot. Um, it's also quite, quite good because once you dress it properly, which I'm going to do in just a moment, uh, basically, um, it, it sits a lot better than a lot of the figure eight knots. Uh, there is a figure nine as well that sort of sits in the middle, uh, which, which sits better than a figure eight, um, but this is probably the best. Um, and you, I was playing around with this and you can actually, you can increase this again if you want to go sort of really hardcore. Um, these are sometimes called barrel knots. So there was one that I was messing around with, which was like a double barrel. So basically rather than the, the half double fisherman's knot, I basically put an extra loop in it as the termination knot and that, that held a little bit even firmer still. Um, but as a termination knot, you just do need to be aware that you, you do lose, if you're putting it, so if I just quickly tie this on, on my lap, around the carabiner. So this is only quite a thin cord, but you do, if you think about how big the cord is in relation to the carabiner that you're using, basically that, that can have an impact on the bend radius that we were chatting about before. So you can have even more loss of strength. So do, do bear that in mind. Um, but it's a very handy termination knot um, and a very handy stopper knot as well. Right, on to the next one. So this is for tying loops. Now, I purposefully did this on quite a big rope. You'd usually just do it on a, a sort of fairly light cord line. So sort of um, eight or 10 mil or something like this. Um, I went for something bigger because I thought it'd be easier to see. So we'll just have a run through this one. This one is a fisherman's loop. Um, I would call this a double fisherman's. It's a way of attaching two ends of ropes together. Um, now I've done it on quite a large diameter rope just so you can see it clearly, but often this is done on eight mil or 10 mil um, cord to make a loop for a brusk or something similar. So take one of your working ends, put it over the other one, and then we're just gonna Tie the knot by looping over and round. So I've got to tie the round twice, and I'm pushing that tail section up through the middle. And this working end needs to be at least two and a half times the damage of the rope I'm doing. So I've got my cross on that side, and my parallel lines there. So once I've done that end, I do exactly the same with the other end. So basically, I'm just going to wrap that around there. It's exactly the same as last time. I can just pull it through and give myself more length. And tuck that up through the middle just as I did last time. To do exactly the same knot. So you can see, I've still got that cross, I've still got those parallel lines. And then just pull the two together to tighten them up. So basically, I've got four lines there and the two crosses. So, and that's a double fisherman's. Now, if you are doing this knot, it is quite important that you proof load it before you're using it. Um, to be honest, generally speaking, and I'm not particularly looking at brands here, but you, you're better off using something that's actually made, um, generally speaking. Um, the, these sort of homemade knots, they're, they're okay, and I used them for years, um, but there is definitely, at least within the UK, there's a move away from those, those types of structures. Uh, but it's a, it's a hand, handy way of tying a loop. The problem is with, with the stitched elements, it's neater because it's a, a smaller structure. Whereas with though it's quite a bulky knot. Um, so and when you basically make that up, um, it can sort of get in the way of things. So you do need to, when you're tying it onto a rope, you need to sort of hold the knot and have a loop that you're going to clip into and the other end that you're going to tie. Um, so you don't sort of get it involved in either end because obviously if you try and break it, then that knot can become loose. Um, and there's a sort of risk element there. So we'll just run through that one again. Now this one is a fisherman's loop. Um, I would call this a double fisherman's. It's a way of attaching two ends of ropes together. Um, now I've done it on quite a large diameter rope just so you can see it clearly, but often this is done on eight mil or 10 mil 
cord to make a loop for a person or something similar. So take one of your working hands, put it over the other one, and then just gonna tie the knot by looping over and around. So I've got to tie the around twice, and pushing that tail section up through the middle. Now this working end needs to be at least two and a half times the damage the rope I'm doing. So I've got my cross on that side, Once I've done that end, I do exactly the same with the other end. So basically, I'm just going to wrap that around there. It's exactly the same as last time. I can just pull it through, give myself more length. And I'm going to tuck that up through the middle just as I did last time. To do exactly the same knot. So you can see, you've still got that cross, you've still got those parallel lines. And then just pull the two together to turn them up. So basically, I've got four lines there two crosses. So, and that's a double fisherman's or there's some word um, asked on that the fisherman's loop. I mean, there is a, there, there's a, a single fisherman's loop, which is, I mean, usually these, the reasons they're called fishermen's is they were used for binding fishing line together because uh, it just sort of locks up. So if you just tie a simple loop on either end and then pull them together, that's just a single fisherman's. Um, this is obviously a slightly more robust version and generally speaking within our borrow culture this is the one we use um, so i'm figuring that's um, the one that people want or was asked for right, moving on then definitely here in the uk this is probably the most commonly taught anyway uh termination knot it has got a lot of weaknesses um and it's quite a complicated knot to tie we've actually tied simpler knots this morning already um but this is the famous bowline and there are loads of different ways of tying this. I've just basically um, looked at the way I most commonly tie it, but there's lots of different ways. The bowline knot is useful to tie it. Take the static end of your line and make a loop. This is a loop where the working end, the end with the tail on, is on top. Static end is on bottom. Take your working end through the loop. I just keep my three fingers so I have the attachment area around the back of the static end and back it down the same loop. It's important when you see a bow line, this loaded section traps. Still important to have a stopping knot on this one. A very useful attachment knot. Now, what you will find with this one is what a lot of people end up doing. Is they end up doing something like this. So basically, so this this working end, the tail that comes out, basically ends up sitting at the front rather than at the back. So that basically it doesn't it doesn't lock properly. So that when it's loaded, it's not actually taking the weight, um, or even worse, they end up tying the the loop the wrong way around. So, so basically, you end up with something that looks a little bit like this. So, see, it goes over, and then when you load it, that element doesn't get trapped. Um, it's got quite a bad reputation the bowline for basically coming undone, and and it it can even when it's tied properly. If we if I just tie that for you again, if you work that backwards and forwards, you can see that it does does come loose quite easily. So even once you've dressed it sort of reasonably well, so you can soon sort of wiggle it and then get it loose. So it is important whenever you're using a bowline that you do have a, a stopper knot on the tail. Um, so I know we've said before with the cinch knots like the bunt line hitch um, and the half double fisherman's, we've sort of talked about um, how long the, the term the piece of rope on the end, the working end has to be. For this one, it really needs to be a stopper knot. So we'll just run through that one again. The bowline knot is a useful attachment knot to tie it. Take the static end of your line and make a loop. This is a loop where the working end, the end with the tail on, is on top. And the static end is on bottom. Take your working end through the loop I just keep my three fingers so I have the attachment area go around the back of the static end and the back end down the same loop. It's important when you see a bow line, this loaded section traps the tail. It's still important to have a 
Okay, so now I was a bit nervous. I, I got asked about this one, which is sometimes called a Yosemite bowline, sometimes called um, a bowline knot with the Yosemite tie off, it has various names. Um, but I think, as I say in the video, a friend of mine was quite badly caught with this one. Um, I was saying about the bowline and how you need to tie it off with a stopper knot, which can just be a figure eight or figure nine or um, half double fisherman's as a termination knot. Um, but what some people do is they do a Yosemite tie off, which is basically looping the, the tail of the rope back into the bowline. Um, you do need to be quite careful about this. Um, and I think I mentioned it in the video, but if not, I'll show you at the end. Um, the next knot is a bowline with a Yosemite tie off. So initially, we just tie the bowline as we normally would. Um, so, same way as we did last time, we just make our loop, pull it through. I've got lots of tail this time a little bit more than I need. That's just our standard bow line. And this time we're going to take the working end put it over into that loop and behind the entire knot. So we basically make a loop on the bottom. And I'm just going to tuck that up through the bow line. So it basically ties off. Now it's quite important that you dress all elements of this boat, the boat line, and the Yosemite tie off. So it's not a knot I'm particularly fond of, although it does in its dress properly hold quite well. I did have a friend who had this slightly loose, and basically ended up getting it caught um, and had quite a bad, a bad accident. So it's vitally important that this is dressed properly. So you get the Yosemite tie off on the bottom, and that's held in. I mean, if you like these kinds of knots, probably a better knot to go is for the half double fishermen's. So because the downside to this is, as I say in the video, so this one that I've tied here basically is quite tightly tied up. But if that loops, this is just on a quite a short piece of cord. So if that loop starts to slip down, if you clip into that, it will hold for a very short period of time and then it'll just drop you. Um, and as I said in the video, one of my friends was quite badly injured um, a number of years ago now but from falling out of a tree using this precise knot. So hence, I'm a little bit nervous to mention it. And as I said in the video, I wouldn't really encourage anyone to use it. It's, it's obviously your choice, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's not one that I'm particularly fond of. Um, on to the running bowline then. I'll just switch the sound off this. Sorry about that. I'll just start that again because you can't really hear anything. So the running bowline, what I'm doing here is I'm making it a large four. And you can see on that side, I'm making the loop again, same way up as we did last time. And then basically, I'm just, I've got that element, the, the tail there, the working end. I'm bringing that through the loop and pulling it tight. You don't have to worry about your fingers this time because basically the rope will catch it and then just back down the same loop. Um, there are a few loops here, so just make sure you're going into the correct loop. Um, and then once you've got it, um, as I was saying with all bow lines here, I've just put figure eight on the end. Um, so if you are using it, um, and then basically just pull it up. Do make sure that that loop on the running bow line is quite small. So because you make it too loop, especially if it's on a small log like this one is, if you're pulling it up on a pulling rope and it's tightening up on something and you've left the loop too big, it'll go around and get stuck in the other side and then it won't give a good grip for whatever you're using it for, uh, whether it's for holding a branch or whether it's for basically a pulling rope on a tree. So make sure that loop, you pull it nice and tightly up. Um, and I'll just play this video again so you can, you can see it all. The biggest bit here is making that big four to start with. So it doesn't matter how big it is, whether it's all the way up the tree, it's just to make sure you've got that shape and then make your loop again, make sure that the, the working end, the tail is, is on the top and your loop's facing in the way. Um, and then basically make sure that's pulled nice and tight round the back of the static end and then back down the hole again. And you're coming out to the back of the knot, just as we talked about with the bowline, it's exactly the same as before. I've left this tail slightly long here, uh, but it was just so I had plenty of space to put whatever stopper knot I wanted to put in there. I chose a figure eight here, which isn't a particularly good choice. Um, something like a barrel knot or a half double fisherman's probably would have been a better choice. Um, but yeah, quite, quite a useful there are better ones, but we're, I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But we'll just do the last of the bow lines I was asked about now. Um, so 
which is the bowline on the bite. Bowline on the bite is a useful midsection knot. It's very similar in rear respects to the bowline as you would expect. So we take our, our bite, our, so a double up and rope, and we make a loop in that rope, similar to how we tied a normal bowline. So basically, the bite that we created was on top, the two lines go up. We then take this loop, put it up through that loop, and then fold that over the entire thing. So I'm interested in this is quite a big issue, um, but it, it's quite a good way of tying a mid-rope mid -rope bowline if you're quite attached to this kind of knot. There's better mid-line knots that we're gonna, gonna look at next. Um, but what we might do before that um, is, um, Sarah's got prepared in the background a pole for termination knots. So basically, if you're, if you're interested, um, Sarah, if you want to launch that pole now for the termination knots, that'd be fantastic. Um, and just which termination knot do you use? So if you're if you're tying on when you're when you're climbing, which one are you? Which one's your preference? Um, and then we've also asked basically, do you, do you use a termination knot at all anymore? Um, a lot of people that I'm chatting to basically now just use spices, um, so or sillet ties or stitch ties or something similar, rather than tying a knot at all. Um, Half double fishermen's here. Yeah. Half double fishermen's or bowline. That that sort of makes sense. Okay, we'll just give it another another ten seconds, and then we'll see how that pans out. It's fifty fifty on the night though. That's surprising. Okay, Sarah, if you want to close the poll, I think that's probably in, enough time. We've got a, a good look there. So half double fisherman's seems to be the most common knot, which I agree that that I think that's the best knot as well. Um, although still a lot of people using the bowline, a um, couple of people using the, or one person, sorry, using the double figure eight. Um, but yeah, 50, 50 on, I thought, I would have thought more of you would have been using a, a, a spliced eye actually. Um, but yeah, interesting. Anyway, right. I shall just, you got any experience with a Smith tie from the bowline? No, unfortunately, Robert, I haven't. So it's not something I've played around with. Um, sorry, I've, I've, Chris is supposed to be keeping an eye on that. That just popped up. Um, right. So next knot, where are we? So, so if you're doing a midline um, knot, this is probably the one that I would would recommend the Alpine butterfly. Um, it has got a lot of different names. I know one of the people that um, sort of, I'm guessing this is what you meant, but people have asked for various things. Um, Nudo Mariposa was one of the requests, um, which I attempted to translate um, and figured that it was this knot. Um, but if that's not the case, if you can pop it in the chat, and if you know what the, the English name for the knot is, sorry to be so limited um, but if you if you do that would be very helpful um, let's play this one an alpine butterfly is a useful midsection rope so the way to tie it is put it onto your hand wrap it around three times and then take one on the end to the middle and then take the one on the end over the other two and through the loop that you've created this goes through there Tight. Once it's in, it just fall into the butterfly. So you can see there the wings of the butterfly and the body of the butterfly. And turn over. You'll see the same again. Very useful midsection knot. Um, it's got lots of different names, though. So I mean, people call this a linesman's loop and various other things. Uh, but once you're loading it, it will just stay statically within that point. Um, um, and one person asked for a retrievable branch anchor for SRT. So if you are using stationary rope technique, this is quite a useful one because you can tie it off, feed the other end through, pull it up and basically put it around your anchor 
and then it'll hold. And then obviously, because you've got the tail on the other end, you can basically pull it back down again. Um, so if you are looking, there are other options, but that's probably sort of my, my preference. Um, right. So I'll just play that one again, because it has got a, a few elements to this one. An alpine butterfly is a useful midsection rope. So the way to tie it is put it onto your hand, wrap it around three times, and then take the one on the end into the middle, and then take the one on the end over the other two, and through, and then you create. This goes through there, and pull it tight. And once it's in, just warm it to the butterfly. So you can see there the wings of the butterfly and the body of the butterfly. So basically, I just quickly tied it there. So you'd basically pop it over. I've not left myself obviously that that long a tail because I've not tied it to the midsection. But then that'd go over the branch, and that'd be your sort of SRT. Obviously, this is the side that you basically load, um, and then when you finish with it, you can just pull it down on that that side. So. So that's a, an alpine butterfly. Well, one of many names that it has. Probably the most common of the friction knots. So we're into basically friction hitches now. Um, so we do seem to be, sorry, I'm racing through these. Um, so if, if you do want to revisit any of these, they're obviously clips, so I can go back to anything you want, or if you want me to sort of tie it live, it's not gonna be as good, I don't think, because I messed around quite a lot with trying to get the camera to, to focus on it. Um, but I'm quite happy to do that. But the Prusik knot's perhaps the most common. Um, so we'll just play on this one. I've tied it two ways though. Most people will just use a loop. Um, so I did that first, but I also tied it as a knot because I'm figuring that was sort of more of the interest. So, so you've got both. Prusik can be tied either with the end of the rope or with the loop. So we'll start with a simpler loop. Take your loop, put it under the rope, put it through once, and then just go the same way round, put it through again. And that's the simplest and most commonly used knots in the arm industry. Sorry, I should have said the arm industry in the UK. See that? All right. Those blakes, it's probably more. Overseas. So you can tie that knot, so I tie it away very simply by wrapping round once and twice. We get two loops and then coming over this element and then doing exactly the same again. So round once and round the second. So this could be with an eye to eye sling like I've done here, or with um, the end of the road. These ends would obviously be the same length, so you just work that round. So basically, if you feed that in, you can work it round. You don't have to re tie the knot, you don't get it to the line right leg. You just work that round. Make sure it's all nicely dressed. It's all nice short on that side. Now, one thing I didn't mention with these, and you probably see with these um, arrangements that I've made up, is the difference in diameter between your climbing rope and your friction knot. Generally speaking, you want a couple of mil difference, which we haven't really got here. Um, so so the, usually if I was climbing on it, I would be climbing with a thicker rope than this. So something more this kind of diameter, which you can't really see this, but sort of um, 12 mil if I'm, if I'm climbing on something like that. Um, the other thing you can do is if you're struggling to get, get it to grip is you can basically do another loop through. So what I've done there is basically the same thing. So on the top with a loop and on the bottom with just um, an, an eye to eye, or it could be the end of the rope to be honest, it doesn't matter. But if you notice, I've just basically done six there and that's a double prusik. So basically similar to this one, but you just go through a, a loop again. 
um, and that that'll give you a little bit more grip. Um, so so it'll also come undone slightly easier. So because it's not going to bind up quite as tightly. Uh, so we'll just play that one again. The prosthetic can be tied either with the end of the rope or with the loop. So I'll start with the simpler loop. So take your loop, put it under the rope, pin it through once, and then just go the same way round, pin it through again. And that's the simplest and most commonly used knots in the arm industry. See that four wraps and then this bite over the top. So you can tie that knot, so I'll pull that out of the way very simply by wrapping round once and then twice. So we get two loops and then coming over this element and then doing exactly the same again. So round once. This could be with an eye to eye sling like I've done here, or with a um, dead throat. These ends would obviously be the same length, so you just work that round. So basically, if you feed that in, you can work it round. You don't have to retie the knot if you don't get it to the right leg. So just work that round. Make sure it's all nicely dressed. done is I've just quickly tied this so just in a piece of rope using the tail of the rope so you can see it as that option so and you'll notice what I've done with the tail is I've just popped a, a stopper knot in it uh, because similar to what we were chatting about with the bowline these tails can come loose now with both of the images that I showed in the film I was using a loop and an eye to eye and because you're clipping in and closing it there's no need for a stopper knot there but if you are using it just on a on a piece of rope or if you're using something like a split tail um, then you do need to tie a basically a, a stopper knot in the end. And that can be any of the, we've talked about a few already today, um, but that can be any of the stopper knots, uh, but it has to be something to pull that tail through because a prussic is quite an open knot. So it will, it has probably, of the ones we're gonna chat about, a quite high potential to both bind and to loosen and slip. Um, so to sort of do bear that in mind uh, when you're tying it, but there we go, that's, that's it just tied in a, a piece of rope. Um, again, if you want me to show you that at the end, we can do. Now, I've not gone immediately onto probably the next most popular knot, which would be a Blake hitch, I would imagine, I'm guessing. Um, I've gone on to a Schwebisch hitch. Uh, the reason I've gone on to the Schwebisch next is because it's more similar to the Prusik. So I thought it'd be an easier one to tie from a development point of view, rather than just going through the most common ones first onto the less common ones. So I've tried, with each one, I've tried to develop them. So uh, basically this is the Schwebisch hitch. The Schwebisch knot is another friction knot. So how you tie this one, it's basically four wraps up. So line on top like you would with a Prusik or a Blake Sitch. Four wraps up, so it's just exactly the same as the Blake Sitch. That's one, two, three, four. And then come across this leg. Similar to a prusik in this respect, coming over this, and then we're just going to tuck round through once. Okay, so basically a shrubbish. So we've got one, two, three, four on the top, one on the bottom, and this bite here. Okay. And that's a shrubbish knot. So you can see it's it's incredibly similar to the prusik. So you're just basically shifting shifting it down. Um, obviously, if it was a prusik that would just be the four, whereas the Schwebisch you've got four up and then the, the hitch on the bottom and to basically lock it off. Um, you will sometimes see Schwebisches with more. So generally speaking, when we're doing this type of knot, the, the, the loops on the top tend to be four or five. 
Um, I have some, seen people do less than that. I wouldn't really advise it. Um, but yeah, that's that's the shrubbish knot. So we'll just play that one again. The shrubbish knot is another friction knot. So how you tie this one, it's basically four wraps up. So line on top like you would with a prussic or a plex hitch. Four wraps up, so it's just exactly the same as the plex hitch. Similar to a prusik in this respect, we're coming over this, and then we're just going to turn around through once. Okay, so basically a shrubbish. So we've got one, two, three, four on the top, one on the bottom, and this bike here. Okay. And that's a shrubbish knot. Okay, so going on again, probably one of the more popular. Um, I'm, I'm guessing this, but in, in North America, I'm guessing this is a, a more popular knot. Um, definitely, um, I worked for an American firm here in the UK for a, for a while, um, and our safety officers that came over from the US were quite keen on the Blake Hitch, and I got quite attached to it for a short time. Um, it's quite a useful knot um, if you're tying off the end of your rope, as we said with the, the, the Prusik earlier. Um, and it's probably a more stable knot than the Prusik, so it, it grips and holds better. Uh, which is why I become, became attached to it and then moved off onto the, some of the other hitches. So this is the Blake's hitch. Blake's hitch is a, a friction knot which can be used with the tail of your rope or an eye to eye sling or a split tail. I'm just going to use an eye to eye here. So basically lay it over your main rope, wrap it around four times. A lot of people wrap the first two loops around their thumb. I don't tend to and what we're doing here but it's quite a useful technique if you struggle to get the rope through the first loop. So I've got one, two, three, four, and I'm coming over the back and over this leg. And then this is where you wrap your rope, and it can be quite useful. If you notice I'm going behind that rope, and I'm trying to get up through the first two. So it's one, and two. Got to bear in mind, you need to use a stock knot on this and make sure it's dressed properly. So, I'm not going to tie the stock knot, you tie a figure eight at this end. That's basically you one, two, three, four, over the back, and then around the back. Must be behind the rope. So, I'll turn it around the other way, you can see. Must sit behind the rope. If it doesn't, it'll slide. So, if you've gone over and up the front, it's not correct. And that's a flex edge. So as, as you can see, it's quite a neat little knot to sort of to tie up. Um, but as I said, basically you'd still put your, your figure eight stopper knot. Quite often if you are tying this, you wouldn't use an eye to eye sling like this. Um, I just don't have any split tails anymore. Uh, generally speaking, you'd use the end of your rope or a split tail for a Blake's hitch uh, because it basically has, um, if it wears out, it's gone and it has that loose tail for tying the stopper knot on it rather than night eye to eye, which is usually shorter um, and it's a bit more difficult to get the length to actually get that stopper knot in and have it a useful length for ascending. So, so that's the Blake's hitch. Um, so let me just run through that one more time. Blake's hitch is a, a friction knot which can be used with the tail of your rope or an eye to eye sling or a split tail. I'm just going to use an eye to eye here. So basically lay it over your main rope, wrap it around four times. A lot of people wrap the first two loops around their thumb. I don't tend to and what we're doing here, but it's quite a useful technique if you struggle to get the rope through the first loop. So I've got one, two, three, four, and I'm coming over the back and over this leg. And then this is where you wrap it around your thumb, it can be quite useful. You notice I'm going behind that rope and I'm taking it up through the first two. So it's one and two. You've got to bear in mind, you need to use a stop knot on this and make sure it's dressed properly. So I'm going to tie the stop knot, you tie a figure eight at this end. That's basically you one, two, three, four, over the back and then round the back. Must be behind the rope. So I'll turn it around the other way, you can see. Must sit behind the rope. If it doesn't, it'll slide. So if you've gone over 
maybe just pick up on a couple of those points. So, so basically, if I just turn this down, so hopefully you can just about see that. So basically, this is this is the the knot with the stopper knot in it. So I just untie that. Again, this is you can probably see why I didn't want to do it this way, just from the point of view of I don't know whether you can really see any of this particularly effectively. Um, but basically, when you're tying it. Um, you lay it over the top of the knot and then basically wrap it around the four times. So I'm using the same same rope now, so it's the same diameter. So basically we've got those four wraps round. So, and then basically you're coming over there and back round and up through those first two. You can see when the diameter is the, a similar size, it actually makes this knot a little bit easier to tie. Make sure you dress it nice and tightly. So that's usually by holding the bridge and the bit that goes up the rope and pulling those two apart um, and then holding the whole knot and pulling the tail through and then basically pop your stopper knot in there. Again, probably a little bit rushed there, so it's a little bit hard to see. You can probably see now why I did the videos, but that's basically the, the Blake's hitch. Um, if you do have it up on the front, it won't grip as well. So that's why I was stressing, making sure you go around the back and then up those first two. Um, so, so do just be careful with that one. Okay, so on to the next one. Now this is my favorite. This is the one I currently climb on um, when I'm using knots, the distel hitch. Now you can do it as a four or a five wrap. Um, so my preference is the five wrap, but either, either or, um, but we'll just play this one. The distel is probably one of my favorite knots. Um, it's quite useful with eye toy slings. So all we're going to do is we're going to wrap, this will be a five wrap to stealth. A lot of people only wrap four times, which is perfectly acceptable. Five wrap is my preference. Wrap one, two, three. Five times. And then come down. So that's the, if you want to see the comparison, that's the four wrap. So you can see on screen, we've got the four on the top and then the one on the underside. And this is the four wrap with the three on the top and the one on the underside. And then that one that peels off is on the back there. So that, that's the alternative. Um, if you want the sort of, the, the sort of, the slightly smaller one. Um, I generally find the five wraps a little bit more stable, so it'll grip. Um, and stay static. So the four wrap I find tends to bind a little bit more um, or come loose and not grip at all. It does depend on your configurations of rope again, um, but just, just sort of bear that in mind. So just play that again. Distel is probably one of my favorite knots. Um, it's quite useful with eye toy slings. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna wrap, this will be a five wrap distel. A lot of people only wrap four times, which is perfectly acceptable. Five wrap is my preference. So I'm going to wrap one, two, three, five times. And I'm going to come down and loop. So bring that back into shot. You can see. Got what looks like five wraps now because one of them killed us. That's one, two, three, four, and one at the bottom. Look at the other side. Got that crossover and that hitch on the bottom. Um, often used with a micro pulley, the slides are fairly effectively. That's a distel. Okay, so on to probably the other. Well, this one's this next one's probably the most popular um, of the sort of what I would class as the modern hitches. It's probably not a very good way of putting it, um, but the sort of in the increase of eye to eyes, um, it's the one that's become most popular. Val de Tatres um, or VT. I've said VT hitch, but yeah, um, just just generally called a VT. Um, so yeah, we'll just play this one. So the VT knot 
worn Falcon Hat dress. Uh, this is very similar in all respects to the style. I won't be quite a preference one way or the other. And I'm telling you, generally speaking, I'll start on the underside. We're still doing that before wrap. Uh, at least. So that was a bit messy in the middle. So one of the things you'll see with the, the VT is basically just how long it is. So it does move very easily and doesn't tend to, to bind up. If you dress it properly as well, it'll grip fairly effectively, but it's just a very long knot. So if you compare it to say something like the, the Distel, that's a much shorter, neater knot. So I'll just quickly tie that. Two, six, one, just quickly. Sorry, let's just talk amongst yourself for a moment. I'll just quickly tie the, the distel from the last, last clip. So basically you can see it's a much sort of tighter unit. So it's a neater one, especially if you're using it on a, um, a lanyard uh, for adjusting. So it's a much neater, tighter knot. Whereas the VT, especially if you're working close to a pole, it can be a bit sort of can get a bit stuck because uh, because of the length of it, um, but the, it doesn't. It does tend to bind up less than the Distel does. So the Distel can still bind, whereas the Valentine's Tress tends to be a more open knot, so it doesn't tend to bind as badly. Um, so we just play that one again. Sorry, it's not a very neat video. This um, I'll maybe try and tie it. Uh, this is very similar in all respects to the Distel. Uh, I you have a preference one way or the other. And I'm telling you, generally speaking, you'll start on the underside. We're still doing that for uh, at least on the top. So maybe just I've missed a few points that might be helpful. So I'll just try and tie this one again. Sort of, I don't know if you can see this, so apologies if it's not the greatest. Um, but basically, when you're tying it, make sure you keep your lengths, your ends roughly the same. So once you've done your four wraps, so basically that's one, two, three, four. When you get to this point, see my tails are massively different. I don't know if you can see that. But basically just work those round so that they're roughly the same length. And then you'll find when you do the rest of it. So see, that's a lot neater now than the video clip. Sorry, it was a bit of an untidy video, but basically I've got my crossover there and then crossover back and back round. So I've got that much neater affair and you'll find you'll get, get your eye to eyes to link better if you do that component um, sort of part way through where you, you line them up um, and then you VT. Again, just remember how big it's gonna be. So, cause it is gonna be quite a long knot. Uh, but it, it'll move quite neatly. So you see that grips fairly easily straight away. Just make sure it's, it's well dressed. Um, you can also see here, I've got a better configuration of ropes. So basically this is a better thickness of rope because I've got the diameter, a better diameter difference between my friction cord and my, in this case, my lanyard. So, so basically it's a, it's a better combination. Whereas in the video, I've used quite a narrow climbing line. Um, hence why it's not gripped particularly well. Um, not, not a great video. Now I've got a note reminding me how to pronounce this and I, I apologize for the video and for me now possibly pronounce, pronouncing this incorrect, correctly. Mitchell Akan not, or Mitchell Akan Hitch. Um, so, so we'll just play this one. 
this one again so, so as you can see basically it's very similar to the Blake Sitch in many respects Most of the videos you'll see online, if you do hunt around a bit, will just be the four wraps. So I just find it functions a bit more stably if you put an extra one on the top. popular a while ago but I don't really know anyone that climbs on them anymore uh, but you'll be able to tell me whether that's still the case or not now this one I'd never heard of before um, and again apologies on the pronunciation Pin, Pindonga or Pindonga Plus um, I think there was a couple of people from Brazil that asked about it um, I have had a play around with it climbing as well and it didn't it wasn't definitely didn't suddenly pop out as my favorite knot um, but this is how to tie it anyway there's there's two versions of this so there's a pindonga and a pindonga plus um, and they're just very slight variations on the same knot so i've tied both um, i think i was asked for the pindonga plus but i thought just for completeness i'd do them both so here they are this knot is actually one i was unfamiliar with um, i'm guessing when well, people have requested it it's coming in south america Again, excuse the pronunciation, but this is a Pindongo first and then a Pindongo plus. So to start with the Pindongo, first we're going to wrap around four times. One, two, three, four. And with this one, we're going to tuck it down the first two. Sorry about that. 
چشم نمیدون So that, that's basically it just tied there. So uh, the Pindonga Plus does seem to function a little bit better. So it pulls out, but again, similar to the VT, you'll see it stretches out quite, quite as quite an open knot. Um, but it ha has a sort of self tending element similar to something like an icicle or something similar to that. Um, so basically that's, that's a Pindonga Plus. So I'll just play that one again. And then at the end, I'll maybe just tie that Pindonga Plus just by itself entirely. I'm guessing by the people that requested it, it's coming into America. And again, excuse the pronunciation, but this is a Pindongo first and then a Pindonga Plus. So I'll start with the Pindonga. So basically, we're going to wrap around four times. One, two. This one, I'm going to tuck down the first two. So, a little bit fiddly. One, two, different. So, I've done with four wraps around. Two of them will be the other. A little bit more length back tail. Because what I'm going to do with this back tail is I'm going to fold it. Okay, so I'll just, just again, I don't know if you can see, hopefully you can see this reasonably clearly. So I've got my rope again. So just basically you're doing your wraps, as we said, just before. So basically we've got our four wraps and then you're just going through the first two, the bottom two, sorry. So basically just going through, through there like that. So you end up with your, your loops and then feeding it through there. Um, and then if we're doing the Pindonga Plus, you're just basically looping that in front of that rope. And then this sort of slightly longer tail, you're scooping underneath that and then around the back. So that's probably a slightly neater than it is in the video. Um, but basically that's your, your Pindonga Plus. So that's basically your, your knot. So reasonably straightforward, but like I said, I had to play around with it and wasn't. I think if you if you like that kind of complexity for tying, um, actually the knot you probably prefer is the, the next one, which is the catalyst hitch. Um, so, so we'll just get onto that one now. And this one is actually quite nice. I had to play around with this the other day and it was, it, it functioned reasonably well. If I can get it to play. So this is a catalyst hitch. Similar to a lot of the knots we talked about already. So I'm we'll just gonna do it. I'm gonna start off four wraps up. Again, four or five generally speaking is the rule. Now, there are some online videos which this few as three. Um, generally it's four or five. So I'm gonna go four this time. So then we're gonna bring that down and across. You do need quite a long tail here to make a bite. Same with your eye to my sleep. Let's cross over. So, basically, 
Russians. When he played around with this a little bit, it just seemed to grip fairly effectively. Um, not enough to know whether it might. You do need to dress this top section quite severely. Um, and this automatic control does grip reasonably effectively. So I'll just run through that one again because it, it is. It's a bit of a meal at the end. The beginning is just the same as normal. Oop, sorry. So this is a catalyst hitch, similar to a light knot. So I'll just switch that off so you can. I'll just talk over it because it's it's probably better sound. So that first element is is just the same as we've been doing so many times. Just make sure you you leave yourself a good good tail so you've got a good end tail uh, when you're doing those wraps so because you do need quite a lot to to do that um, unlike the pindonga we're not going to tuck this in we're just going to lie it over the top so and then that tail element you're just going to make a bite in that tail so i'm not sure i let it catch up and then your other end yeah so you're just going to basically feed that through and feed it through and lock itself. So that's why you need so much of a tail for that bit. So, because you do need, if you leave yourself a nice long tail on that, that front leading end, then that will make it a lot more straightforward. Um, and then you end up with a, a knot that looks like that. So, so it's not quite as open as say the VT it's still quite an open knot though, but it does it does seem to grip reasonably well. Um, and definitely, I only used it for a, like a couple of hours, um, but it, it seemed to hold reasonably well and, and functioned reasonably well when I had to play around with it the other day. Um, so that's basically all of the hitches that I was asked to tie, sort of climbing hitches I was asked to tie. So we're gonna do another poll if that's okay. Um, so basically what climbing hitch do you do you climb on? Um, so Sarah, if you want to launch that poll for me, that would be fantastic. Don't know if you're there, Sarah. There we go, brilliant, thank you. Oh, that's the termination one again. Oh, there we go, thank you very much. <laughs> oh no, that is the termination one again. Oh, what's going on there? Oh, there we are. Excellent. <laughs> So what do you climb on basically? What's your favorite climbing hitch? Or for that matter, have you gone completely onto some sort of mechanical device? Well, there we go, someone's climbing on a catalyst hitch. There we go, I'll just give you another 10 seconds. There we go, I think that's, is everyone? Oh, what we've got. I think that'll do it. If you want to close the poll, Sarah, that'd be fantastic. Shockingly, Prussics have it. So hard, hardly surprising. It does seem to still be the most popular knot. Uh, but not many people prefer any mechanical devices. So you're still pretty much focusing on the Prusuk. I mean, it, it, it's what I learned to climb on when I started climbing as well. Um, just a little message for you. There are other knots out there. They do function a little bit better than a Prusuk. They're not as easy to tie, I know, with the loop, um, but there are other knots that will function better. So um, yeah, all those times when you curse your Prusuk because it's slipped or bound up, then maybe have a think about something something different. Right, I'll just get rid of that. Okay, so there's a couple more knots. We're actually cracking through this at a fair rate of knots. There's a couple of other knots um, of various descriptions that people have asked me to sort of have a look at. So um, what have we got first? So we've got a trucker's hitch. Oh no, Zeppelin bend. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot about this one. So most people probably use a sheet bend for linking two ropes together, but this is a slightly more uh, robust way of linking two ropes together. So this is a Zeppelin bend. Zeppelin bend. Um, so joining two pieces of rope together, so two ends of rope here. So from one side, I'm going to do a six with the tail of the rope on top. You can see that. And on the other rope, I'm going to do a nine. 
other side. Went up from the six, on top of the nine, and then the tail of the six is going to go under the loops through. And the tail of the nine is going to go over the loops through. That's as if that is. As you can see, tails on both sides. It's important to have enough tail so that they won't pull through. Basically, they will link together. Okay, that's as end of that. So you can see it's just slightly more robust than a, a sheep pen. So I just quickly show you a sheep bend. So I'm pretty sure all of you have, have done sheep bends. So basically you just make a bite and then just basically go round. If you just went in that way, that would be a reef knot. Um, but if you went in through and across, that's the beginning of your locking knots. So that's that's a sheet bend. So basically you can see it just locks off. And the Zeppelin bend is basically just a much more robust version than that. It binds together even more effectively. Um, so I'll just run that one again. Um, the key thing is when you do the six element, just make sure that your, your tail's on the right side and the same with the nine, because if you get them the wrong way up, um, it'll just fall apart. So, so just, do pay attention to that part of the video. This not is a Zeppelin bend. In fact, I just switched the sound off so you can hear more effectively. So, um, so basically, you'll see. Initially, I get it the wrong way up, and then basically have to flip it round because if I'd had it the, that way around, it wouldn't have functioned. So the the working end needs to sit on the top for the six. So and exactly the opposite's true for the nine. So basically, because you you're tying it through the whole loop, so it it locks on itself. And then if you pop the six on the top, so you'll see I'm taking the tail and then I'm going underneath and through both of those loops. So it's binding onto both. Um, and exactly the opposite with the nine. So the nine's going over the top and through. So basically, so all elements are locked into all the different components. So, and that's the Zeppelin bend. So again, good way of, if you need to extend a, a rope by sort of linking them together, quite a useful, useful knot. Um, and then what else do we have? Yes, next we have the trucker sitch. Now a trucker sitch most commonly you'd use it for tying down basically loads. So if you had brash on a trailer or something, I've just done it onto a fence here. Um, so it just seemed the simplest way to, to sort of set it up but often you'd be tying it down onto like trailer hooks um, and then throwing it over. And the way I've locked it off means that each tail you can throw over so you can bind it down, tie it off, throw the rope back over and then do the same on the other side, bind it down and, and backwards and forwards. But I'll play the video rather than just wittering on. So this is a triple stitch. So we have the rope that's going over the back of a brush and the trailer. And the rope. So you can't really hear the sound because I'll just switch the sound off. So basically that, that loop element there, I'm just clipping into the carabiner. I've not made a particularly big loop there. So usually you'd make that loop bigger because obviously once you run out, that's it. It's it's finished. And then all I've done is put a couple of half inches on the end here just to lock it off. So, and then basically that, that'll just hold in position. And then basically that tail end, you can then throw over the trailer, basically throw it over another trucker's hitch on the other side and then basically bind it down. Someone was asking me for knots that will always be releasable. Uh, well, this is, it doesn't have a lot of uses this one, but this one, as soon as you take the pressure off, it just falls apart. So basically it's, it's very easy to release. Um, so I'll just play that one again, but I'll talk through it this time rather than relying on the sound from the video. So you can see here, I've basically got the rope. I tied it off on something, but you usually just throw that over a trailer or something similar. Um, and then the bite that I put in, I've just looped that over so it holds. And then at least two twists, you can obviously put more in, but at least two twists. And then I've just fed that loop through the loop at the bottom. Um, if you don't put enough twists in, the, the bite will just pop out. 
um, so it won't won't rip properly. And then once you've got that set up, then you can just haul down on that rope, and that's it basically loaded then. So and that's when it's useful. Once it's under weight, that's when it's it's useful, and then you can just use whatever you use to, to tie off the end. I generally just use half hitches because they come out really easily. So basically that's just locked off and then just throw the end over, like I said. So that's a trucker hitch. So now another one of the easily removable, um, easily releasable knots, sorry. Um, it's probably better than, we did a running bowline right at the beginning of this session um, which probably is the most common one you use for tying on, pulling ropes and the like. Um, but actually, more recently, the daisy hitch is actually a better version. Uh, some of you might tie daisy chain up your ropes when you're putting them away. I mean, most of you probably just stuff them into rope bags. Uh, but if you do daisy chain your ropes up, you'll be reasonably familiar with this because it's not that dissimilar. Um, so I'll just play the video. This is a daisy hitch. So it's another running hitch. This time, exactly the same as the running bow line. And make a large fall on this side and twist it to create a bigger end type shape. And take that loop through there. And basically just continue to come through. So it locks on, comes up, and just pulled on just like the running bow line. The main advantage to this point is it actually happens. So we come down to the ground. I mean, the big thing here is even if that, even if the the head of whatever's come out has basically pinned it, as long as you can get to that tail and just take out that that pull, then you can basically pull it loose and then pull the rope out. So in that sense, I know you can on a running boat line you you can break the back and that sometimes works, but if it's really bound up, that can be problematic. Whereas with a daisy hitch you're not going to have that problem. So I'll just play that one again and I'll maybe just talk through it rather than relying on the sound because again, it wasn't wasn't great because it was outside. So all I'm doing here is I'm doing the big four, which is just basically a way of saying you've you've got the, the other rope included in it and then you've got your static and your working end on the rope that you're actually working with. And then I'm just doing a crossover like I would do for a, for a figure eight knot. And then I'm just pulling that through. So, and then that creates the lock on that rope. And then, to be honest, you can pull through as many loops as you want. So if you've got a longer tail, you can just pull them through to keep it short. Um, and then that's basically it tied up. Once you've done that, uh, when it gets down to the ground, I've obviously pulled it loose just to show it, but that could be trapped under something. And once you pull that tail out, you can just pull it and release it. So it's, it's quite a handy handy knot to, to do. Um, and I've raced through those because I think that's everything. Oh no, there's a montage, sorry. Sorry, my apologies, I've forgotten about that one. Um, so, mund hitch is basically a belay knot. Um, so, so yeah. I'll just play this. So, we're going to here, we're going to make a turn in the road that way. Opposing to it, on both sides, bring the two together. What can I mean? That makes you. Which way you go on this one? Go that way. So you can't really hear the sound. So basically, it's a, it's just a belay knot. Um, so obviously, there are belay devices you can get, um, and you would never just straight belay. Uh, but for example, if you're doing a rescue and trying to take pressure off a system, um, or yeah, trying to to belay someone in a sort of rescue scenario, you'd usually have backup over the top of it, but it's just a, a simple belay. To be honest, we don't use it particularly commonly in our culture, uh, but it is a hand knot, so I'll just play that again. Um, I'll just take the sound off those. So you can see I've made a, a loop one way and then an opposing loop. So basically we've got them in the two different directions and then it's looped over. So not like the cow hitch where I've included both tails, but it's just, it's very similar in many respects to the cow hitch but I've just not included one of the tails, so that's off to one side, and then that's your, your belay. So you can basically feed it through. Um, it does fire the rope around quite a tight bend radius, so it's pretty hard on both the carabiner and the, and the rope, um, so do bear that in mind. But if you just want to take a bit of pressure off, so, so basically if, you, if you're coming down on a rescue descent, for example, um, that's when that's the 
about the only time I'll use it is basically to take pressure off the tail uh, when I'm teaching people to do aero rescue. Um, you just basically put it onto the rescuer's line um, if you're using that, that method. Um, and it just takes the pressure off. If they're loaded onto your static end and you're basically on the other side, um, it'll just take that pressure off. Um, so we'll maybe just play that one more time. So basically we've got a loop here. I don't know why I did that extra twist in there. You'll see it, it doesn't, it's not needed, it's just there. And then you just fold those two together and then clip them together. And then that's basically locked onto there. Um, and you can see, don't worry about it going both ways. You just want it to go one way. Uh, it's just, you know, if you've got it, if you pull it both ways and it just folds out either way, you know, you've got it right. So that's the, the key element there. So, and that, that's me. So we've, we've sort of gone through everything. So um, basically that's, that's all the knots I was asked to, um, to look at. So, um, Chris has been keeping an eye on basically um, the the question side of things. So, Chris, what questions have there been? Because sorry, Ooh. I've been paying no attention at all. There are a few, Matt. Um, so, what's come up? What have we got? Um, we were asked, uh, do you know about the Smith tie-off for the bowline? A Smith tie-off for the board. No, it, it's it's not one that I'm familiar with, unfortunately. Um, I can definitely find out about it um, and have have a look at it, um, but off the top of my head, no, it's it's not one that I've I've played around with. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, no harm in that's not very good answer. But it's, there <laughs> we go. Sorry. Um, oh, and before I forget, I uh, I should share has asked for me to remind everybody that there'll be a knot tying competition at the next ARB show. So uh, once you've um, digested these knots and had the practice, you might like to try the knot tying competition that's coming up. I, I should also mention that this video will be available on YouTube uh, for, so that you can uh, practice these knots at your leisure. So it's great Matt's gone over this this morning, but the point is it's a resource that will be there that you can visit whenever suits and you can recap. Practice does make perfect after all, doesn't it? Um, I was asked, would you mind, Matt, just taking a minute to go over the running bowline again? Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. Or just show us, uh, is that okay? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So uh, just, where are we? Um, it needs to go around something, so sorry, I'm just furiously grabbing things on the, on the ground, so um, it's a little bit hard to do in this sort of environment, but I've got a log of wood here just to, I don't know, is, is can you see that? So basically, if yes, I just get all this rope out of the way, so you can see it. So basically, if you just go round your... Round your log, give yourself plenty of tail. And then that's your, your big four that we mentioned. So, and then you're gonna make a loop in this side. So basically, so you've got the, the working end, the tail on the top um, and the static end on the bottom, just as you would do with a bowline. So, and then you're basically gonna pull that up and through. See, we can pull that tight in now. We don't want that loop to be big because if it is, it can go round the back and get caught on itself. So basically we're pulling that nice and tight and then we're basically going round the back there. So we're going round the back of this static end and back down that loop. So this rope that goes round the tree, we're completely ignoring. So that would just be, if it was just a standard bowline, that would be basically your carabiner or what, whatever it was that you were clipping into. So but with a running bowline, it's exactly the same as a bowline, but you just loop it round before. And then just make sure, as I think I said in the video, just make sure you pop a stopper knot in the end. Um, and then that's your running bowline. You can see there when I've tightened that down on the log, because I've got quite a small eye. So see, it's not going around the back and getting jammed on itself. I'll just show you what happens if you if you don't do that. So I just quickly undo that for a moment. So just bear with me a moment. So if I make a running bowline, but leave that loop way too big. I'll just show you what the potential problem is. So I need a little bit more rope for this bit. 
Ooh. So if I just leave that, that loop massively big. Now, I've not put a stop knot in the end of this, but it's more to prove the point than it is for anything else. So, so I've just tied that running bow line again. And then basically when I pull that through, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that knot's jamming against that? And then this won't grip. Now on a pulling rope, that's problematic. But if you're using it actually to tie onto a branch to lower it down, for example, then basically that'll just slide out. So it's, it's very problematic. So just to run through what I'd actually like you to do. So basically the big four, the loop, and then as soon as you put that through, just pull that as tight as you can get it. So basically it's not gonna pull through, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and then go around the back um, and then back down. So, so basically that's, that's that one there. So that, and then you can see that'll pull nice and tight. Um, and then we've still got enough space to just squeeze in our stopper knot there. So it's nice and neat and it'll grip on nice and tightly. So um, you'd only really use something like a running bowline or a daisy hitch when you can't get to wherever you're tying it onto. So you're running it out to somewhere. So there's better knots. If you're going to tie it onto a, a branch um, and you want it to hold effectively, then there are much better knots. So even just something like a cow hitch, which we looked at at the beginning. So, so basically, if I just bring that back down, so the, the cow hitch, you can see you've just got more surface area for gripping. So that's a, a sort of a better tie off. Um, so but just don't forget that tail, because it's quite a loose knot, that tail can come loose. So just our two half hitches there. And that, that basically has got more of a grip there than you did have with the running bowline. So it's, it's better not, which I know wasn't the question, but I just sort of went off on a bit of a tangent. So hopefully that answers the question. Or did I go through that too quickly? No, I think that was helpful, Matt. Thank you. No, I think that answers it. And it's good advice as well about the size of the eye that you, you create. Um, the only other question, Matt, so there's one last question, and forgive me if I haven't picked this up right, but is there any info on ZEP's performance under reciprocal loading? Um, it, it depends. So there's there's a, a few online guys that basically proof load uh, these things and basically look at things like reciprocal loading. So basically loading the different sides. Um, so um, actual peer reviewed evidence. I'm just trying to think it's, it's not something I've come across. I mean, there's lots of chats um, and basically sort of talk about it. Um, and definitely that would be one of the knots you could use in that kind of configuration. Um, but as far as actual testing and, and sort of peer reviewed evidence, um, nothing immediately springs to mind. To be honest, you'd be amazed. There's, there, there is some stuff out there. I know a friend of mine, Rich, had some stuff that he talked at with some of, at some of our instructor updates um, on various bits of testing that have looked at some of the knots. Um, and for a long time, we didn't even know basically how much strength loss was used in a lot of these knots. And when we when it was actually tested, I think the people at Lion Equipment did some proof load testing, um, basically on the knots and how how much strength loss was was occurred with the various knots. Uh, but there's there's very little evidence out there. So, um, but there are there's there's more coming up now in the recent past. There's more popping up, but I haven't seen any any peer reviewed stuff, which I'm guessing is what they're after, not just, is that what you're looking for, peer reviewed sort of test data rather than just, um, I did this in my shed once. I, so, I, would, um, I would imagine so, Matt, but uh, yes, yes. But yeah, there's there's some some online guys, there's a, a, a guy in the States whose name escapes me, um, but he'll pretty much, he's got a test rig and he just proof loads various things. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that I follow on Facebook. Um, and he looks at different ropes that are, are, are either old or, or basically different knots or a lot of the stuff in the States is people self-stitching eyes um, and whether that will hold or not, uh, which is quite interesting. But it's none of it's peer reviewed. I mean, it's obviously it will give you the load that it, it fails at, um, but, but none of it's peer reviewed. So. I, th 
I think the gist of it from reading the question fully from Robert uh, was maybe a bit of concern about using some of these knots, these friction knots, uh, when descending, especially when in a rescue situation. Well, a zeppelin bend wouldn't you wouldn't use a zeppelin bend in that situation. So zeppelin bend is for li linking two ropes together. So um, is was was the question about zeppelin bends? Um, it, it was abbreviated to just ZEPS um, performance under reciprocal loading. I think the gist of the question is that there's the concern of using some of these knots in a rescue situation. Well, you wouldn't, you, you would never use it in a rescue situation. So basically, a, a Zeppelin bend more commonly would be, say, if you had a rigging scenario where you were linking two ropes together and you wanted it to be a stable link, um, that's, that's when you'd use a a zeppelin bend you wouldn't you wouldn't use it in a rescue scenario it's for linking ropes together so um and i think what he was saying about with reciprocal loading was basically there's there's basically four uh so hang on if i just quickly just talk amongst yourselves while i faff around with this um so if we um So I just quickly do it on my lap. Okay, while you're doing that, Matt, uh, yeah. Robert, uh, who posed the question, has been sort of promoted to panelists so he can ask you directly. Is that okay? okay. Yeah, far, far away. Hello, Robert. Hey. Uh, How's it going? Nice you, Matt. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, not reciprocal, uh, cyclical loading. Uh, I'm uh, I'm using the the Zeppelin bend to uh, to be able to retrieve my uh, choked off anchor point when I'm uh, doing SRT uh, sometimes to ascend and okay. in a rescue situation it's quite uh, uh, possible to use the retrieval line if it's a rated line to actually uh, enter the tree uh, as as long as the 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 lifeline part is actually loaded. There's enough yeah. friction in there for you to be able to climb it, up, climb up it. But I'm I'm concerned about the zeppelin bend performance in cyclical loading, not reciprocal loading. Sorry. Um, but no, sorry, it, I, I not looked at the question. I was I was just <laughs> I was just answering Chris's question. So so I've set up a zeppelin bend here. So basically, you, you're using it. So what, are you tying an alpine butterfly and then using that as the way of? Yeah, usually I have a, a running alpine or a running bowline there for to to enter the tree. Usually yeah. I I advance my system afterwards. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, so in case that I would be somewhere and uh, in a rescue situation, somebody trying to climb the the retrieval end of that line, yeah. uh, would would it be any issue of the the zeppelin bend coming undone? Because it's like it's such a nice uh, knot to. Uh, to untie after it's being loaded, it's quick and easy, that kind of thing. I don't really like tying like, I don't know, like a double fisherman's or something to, to connect a rope together. I mean, the, uh, the worry I have, so to answer your first question, as far as the Zeppelin bend's concerned, no problems at all. The bit that I'd worry about is if you've got something like an Alpine butterfly on here and someone's loading this end, obviously that's the retrieval end. So basically, yeah, yeah. now you're, you're loaded on that side, so someone coming up that other side would be problematic. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very, very well aware of this. This being a, a non-optical, op optimal situation. Like it's, yeah. it usually there's. I mean, I've tried this, and like there is enough uh, friction in the system to be able to, in a rescue situation, go up that retrieval line. It's not yeah. something that you would like to do. But, no, uh, no. I mean, it's possible to do, but that's why I'm asking if the zeppelin bend in that situation is uh, is prone to coming undone but yeah obviously if you have a long enough tails maybe it's it's okay yeah i mean the yeah the there are more things about that that worry me than the zeppelin bend so basically um because you're talking about things that are quite risky anyway one of the first things you'll think about in any rescue scenario is is making sure that you're not putting the rescuer in danger so because you've got this sort of hierarchy that you go through um that when you're thinking about rescue scenarios and the, the 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 thing that you wouldn't do is you would make sure that your rescuer had enough equipment to perform the rescue and didn't put themselves in danger because obviously you've then got two people in trouble up the tree 
Now, if you've got a system which is basically you're using the removal end, which you've got your Zeppelin bend on, um, and you're loading off the other side, then your weight might be enough to hold that up, but then they're effectively hot climbing on a loose system. So now the, the chance of the Zeppelin bend coming out, if it's been dressed properly, are very low. But basically, you could pull the whole system in. So because basically that's that's sliding out. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No, I'm aware of that. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd I'd be the Zeppelin bit. I'm not worried about, but the rest yeah, of yeah. it, I'm really worried about. <laughs> so yeah, so so yeah, don't do like that. that. That would be be a, a last case uh, scenario kind of thing. I'm 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 just theory crafting here. It's not that yeah. I'm this is my go to way of doing rescue, but it's an option if you know it's not. I, I'm aware of all the safety issues with it. I'm yeah, just... that's that's the wide ranging safety. Yeah. Issues. So, so yeah, <laughs> I mean, obviously, from a everyone says this, but the quickest way to do rescue is self rescue. So basically, obviously, if you've got that system in place, then to get yourself, however badly injured you are, the quickest rescue is always going to be you. So basically, make sure you carry proper first aid kits, and then whatever it is, deal with it. Obviously, if you're unconscious, not a possibility, but basically. If it's a bleed or something like that, get your first aid pressure on and then get down as quickly as you can. And then everyone else can worry about it on the ground. Um, but going up the the removal side of an SRT system would would freak me out a bit. But that hopefully that answers your question, Robert. Yes, there's Zeppelin yeah, yeah, very stable, but but don't I'll do that. The Zeppelin bend performance, not the, the other stuff, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Just just don't do it though. But the Zeppelin <laughs> bend will be lovely for you, but don't do that. Hopefully that's everything. Uh, Matthew, have a couple of other questions for you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, but a couple of other questions. Uh, okay. We have been asked, could you give your opinion on hitch climber knots, please? For instance, do you feel that the stale is better than the VT, for instance? What would your, your summary on that be? Um, it's personal opinion. Basically, I love the distel, so I think it's great knot. Although I was quite impressed. I was playing around the catalyst knot the other day. And that seemed to function quite well. I don't really think that I'll get into using the catalyst knot, not because it's not a good knot, just because um, the distel functions so well. Um, a lot of people that I chat to that, that don't like the distel generally don't like it because they do a four app. So if I just quickly, hang on a sec. So, so basically, so a four app distel um, is just. <laughs> So it's just that. So I'll tidy up the legs and dress it a bit. So basically, so that's your four up distel. So that's the, the sort of one that most people tie. Um, and it does tend to be quite a bindy and sort of not, not a particularly nice knot. Uh, whereas I generally speaking find the, the five wrap distel more functional now. It's that worked perfectly well, unfortunately. Um, so one, two, three, four. But this this would be my preference as far as a knot's concerned. So because it's it's as soon as you've tied it, it's I mean there's not much dressing involved, and it's a nice stable knot, and you can see it's quite a compact knot as well. So basically, it sits where you put it, and it sort of stays there. So so that that tends to be sort of my preference with twin line working though. What I'm finding more and more with both the VT and the Distel. Um, is the non-loaded line because they're such a an open hitch they do tend to work quite loose and they can come on your other side they can come quite loose um, so if you're using a configuration where you've got twin line working sorry this is for the uk by the way probably rather than anywhere else um, when you've got your twin line working system whichever one's taking the bulk of the load the other one doesn't tend to hold quite as effectively so you do need to really work on that dressing. Obviously, if you're using mechanical stuff, it's not, not an issue. Um, but as far as the VT is concerned, the other thing with the VT is the length of it. So it's a big old knot. So basically, if I just do that same um, sort of four up. Oh, sorry, I'm not showing you this. So if I just do that same four up. So remember, four ups make, make the tails. So I'm faffing around with this, make the tails the sort of same length, and then basically cross that over backwards and forwards. So if you've got your VT there, you can see it's a sort of slightly longer, more spread out knot. And I know I've sort of opened that up a bit, but that is how it tends to open up. 
Now, it doesn't tend to bind as much, but you do have that extra length. So that's something you're comfortable with, and that's actually fine. But I tend to find if it's on a side strop, and basically I'm adjusting up, um, then if you're quite close to a pole, that's quite a lot of length, hence why I prefer the distel. So if you're just going to learn one of the knots, um, then probably the distel would be my personal favourite. Um, but yeah, the Catalyst, I think, has, has legs too. Um, the VT, I mean, the VT is a great knot. There's, there's no two ways about it, but it is quite long. So, but yeah, I think that's probably enough wittering about that. Just hope that answers. No, that, that's not wittering at all. It's very interesting. I'm sure people are interested on your personal take on these, Matt. So thank you. Uh, and I think it might be the last question, Matt, but a very relevant one. Uh, what's your recommendation uh, for an SRT-based anchor? Oh, um, what's the best SRT-based anchor? Um, hmm. I mean, there's quite a few options, to be honest. So, I mean, yeah, my, my general preference, and obviously it depends on the tree, is not to use a ground-based anchor. Um, it has got, got potential. Um, and mostly where I have used it, I use a, a sort of se separate anchor. Um, so basically there's there's a belay element to it. So I'll, I'll put a belay. So I've got a rig um, that I set up basically as a belay device. So basically I put a ground anchor on the tree, just choker it with a, uh, basically, um, well, it's just a, 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 it has a spliced eye in it. So it, it splices off. And then I have my rig on the back and then basically run it through my Petzl rig. Um, and that means that basically, um, Robert was mentioning earlier before about rescue, that means there's belay built into the system. So basically there's a, and there's, there's belay with safety in there. So if you use something like that, I mean, you could use like a figure eight descender uh, with something like a clemice. Uh, what's a clemice? I haven't shown that. Not very much. So basically, um, so you could use something like a clemice or clemice um, above it. So basically that's just, um, so I've just used a loop here, wrapped it around three times and then pop that off there and then just have that over the top of a um, figure eight. So that'll basically lock and hold. And then you've basically got belay built into your system. Um, so it's not a common choice, uh, I know, but if you're gonna go to the effort of putting a ground anchor in, um, then you might as well set it up for belay. Um, and then basically, just make sure your ground staff know what they're doing. Um, obviously, good ground staff are worth their weight in gold. Um, you're gonna in the UK anyway. You're gonna have to have a rescue climber, so so they should know about these things. Um, but if they might not be familiar with belay, but basically make sure they are if you're going to use something like that um, and set a belay into the system. So 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 yeah. So some sort of belay system might. And it's loads of gear, I know, sorry, um, isn't knots at all. <laughs> it's basically um, tying off a ground anchor, which goes through an eye, and then um, putting a rig on the back of it so you can belay. So is that is that okay? <laughs> Thanks so, Matt. I think that's, that's very detailed. Um, yeah, and I, I think, and I apologise to anybody if I've missed anything, but I believe that's all the questions so far, Matt. Um, so thank you very much for your time and effort. It really is appreciated. Uh, it's been very educational, but I'm glad there's a chance to go back and uh, review these knots and, and practice. Um, that, that's very useful. Uh, but yes, as I say, I think that's all the the questions thus far. We'll, we'll give people just a few seconds if there's any last burning questions. Uh, now is your chance. But most people are just saying thank you. Everyone's passing on a thank you. Uh, yeah, no, my, my pleasure. Um, hopefully you found it useful. So, um, and yeah, I know we didn't cover all the knots. Um, I know a couple of people asked for every knot possible, um, but hopefully we, cover, we covered a good, good batch there um, and answered all the sort of specific questions. But yeah, but, but thank you very much for attending and thank you to Chris and Sarah for looking after me in the background um, and, and the Arb Association and the Scottish branch for, for putting this on. And hope, hopefully you found the, use, the videos useful um, and can watch them back at your leisure.
So, so have a great Saturday. Yeah. Thank you, Matt, and thank you for everybody that attended. Uh, it's been a very useful uh, Saturday morning, more productive than normal, I might add. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Take care. Cheers. And don't worry, Robert, you didn't give me a heart attack. <laughs>